I'm Scott Allen Miller. This is my everyday life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today I'm going to be doing a response video to a Costa Rica stories, a gringo's dilemma. We're going to get to that right after the ball. All right, in a Costa Rica stories, a gringo's dilemma, there was a discussion about how gringos are expats moving into a new country, specifically Costa Rica and his example over on uh, Loco Mono. I don't catch the guy's name. He's got a channel uh, and he does real estate and information on Costa Rica. It was a very good video, I think overall. So uh, you definitely check it out. One of my uh, members sent it over to me. and was like, what about this in Nicaragua? I'm really concerned about these things, whatever. So it's a good discussion to have. So we're, we're tackling Nicaragua from the same perspective. Costa Rica really has some major problems when it comes to the number of gringos in the country or at least a perceived problem and this is an important thing to differentiate so let's start with what the problem actually potentially is costa rica has a very large number of gringos specifically expats but there's a lot of them from north america when gringos come into Costa Rica, they have a tendency to spend lots of money, buy large lots, build huge houses, take over giant swaths of land, and ultimately change the character of Costa Rica. So this is important to understand that this is what people are generally upset about, is that the country that they love, primarily the Ticas, the Costa Ricans, they are seeing their country change and they are not necessarily in favor of that change happening. Now, of course, there's also the problem that not everyone is opposed to this. Some people are opposed to this, and easily a lot of people are opposed to this, but a lot of people are not opposed to this. So we don't have a consensus. We have some voices that come out and say, and this is true anywhere, we really don't like immigration, or we don't like this type of immigration, or we don't like this behavior with immigrants, and we would like it to slow down, stop, reverse, any number of things. And, and that's very, very valid. And you can see this if you're from the United States, you see a lot of people who say, oh, I, I'm really worried about immigration. I don't like the behavior of immigrants. I don't like having immigrants. But then you also have loads of Americans who are like, no, I seriously want more immigrants. We're not getting enough. We'd like to welcome them in. We'd like to you know, open the floodgates and have two, three times as many as we do now. So you get both sides. But one side has a tendency to be much more vocal because they're angry about something that's happening. And the other side is like, no, I'd, I'd be perfectly happy with as many or more but it's not something to be upset about. They'd just kind of like if they had some more. So you tend to have one side be a lot more vocal. And I think you're going to see the same thing in Costa Rica because it's exactly the same. You've got a bunch of immigrants coming in and some people are being uh, priced out of their market because of it. The beauty that they're used to in their environment is disappearing because of it. And, uh, you know, it's changing and they're perceiving, probably rightfully so, that the immigration is creating or being a major force behind these changes. So you get a natural group of people who want the immigrants to go, but you also have, naturally, the people who are selling the land to them in the first place. Clearly, they want them to be there. So in order to block the immigrants from coming in, you also have to take away the rights of the landholders to sell their land to those people. So that's a big problem, right? When you start saying, well, I want to start controlling to whom you can sell what you own. That's a big problem topic to tackle for a country. Do you really want what comes with selling to just anyone? That's what's happening right now, more or less. Or do you want what happens from not allowing people to freely buy and sell land? That has its own implications. That's a complicated thing. So right now, Costa Rica is very much on this side, which a lot of people, if you ask them in this context, they'd be like, of course, that's where you want to be. But then people say, but no, I want to control who you're allowed to sell your house to. But are you a landholder? Then do you get the same? Like, there's a lot of questions that come up with this. This is a difficult topic. So on one side, you've got the people who own land, have invested in land. And we're talking Costa Ricans here, right? At some point, all this land uh, belonged to Costa Ricans. And if they own land, and they're like, well, now there's people to sell it to. And I want to sell it because I want to make that money. I invested. My family invested. I've had it for generations. Now's my chance to cash out while the, while the values are high. Well, they want to get that money. And where does that money go? Into the Costa Rican economy. So then those people go and spend money in the economy and all kinds of people are winning. People who don't realize that that's where a lot of source of the money is coming from is that they were able to sell land at high prices. But they do see that their own prices go up and that means it's more difficult to buy, it's more difficult to rent. So there's negatives, but there's positives and often they're so far apart. When the price goes up, people say, why is my price going up? And they say, well, there's gringos coming in, there's expats, so it's raising the prices, which is true. 
but they leave out. But the reason that the economy is doing so well, the reason that there's so much money to spend on these things is because of the same thing. And so you can't have one without giving up, the, you can't get rid of one without giving up the other, you can't have one without the other. That's a difficult situation because nearly everyone, if you ask them, is very much in favor of the economic power driven by this tourism and expat economy. And nearly everyone hates the fact that tourism and uh, expat driven economies have a high cost of living associated with them. The two go together and so, you ha so we can't have this discussion in the way that people are having it on The Gringo's Dilemma in Costa Rica uh, with that show because they're leaving out the other side, which is that it comes from having freedoms, it comes from having open immigration, it comes from having open property uh, sales rights, it comes from having a tourism-based economy. So Costa Rica has made some really strong decisions that they want to be a tourism economy. And that's great. That is, Costa Rica made a move that they said, we can do great things for our ecology, we can have, uh, you know, no military, we can have all these really amazing benefits by being a tourism-based economy. And they've gone down that path in a really dramatic way, one of the most dramatic ways of any country in the world taking such a focus on tourism. And so because they did that, and because they continue to do that, they are going to have some extremely high cost of living because everyone who goes to Costa Rica naturally goes, I want to live here because it's a vacation haven. It's got great ecological benefits. It's so clean and green and, and beautiful, like obviously. So they're driving a situation that causes a high expat rate. Now they have every possibility, every right, it is their sovereign nation's right that they can at any moment decide to retune their system. They can change simple things like, well, we're going to advertise less for tourism because well, that's all we have to do, and they'll, they'll slow down the people coming to Costa Rica for sure. But they don't want to. They're currently advertising. Maybe not as much as they ever did, but they are currently still promoting themselves as a tourist destination. So they're not attempting to curtail this process. They're attempting to ramp it up. They can always make expatting more difficult. They can make visas harder to get. They can raise the prices. They can add taxes. They can add hard limits, right? They can put quotas on. They can do those things. But are they? No, they did the opposite. They made moving into the country easier this year to make it more in line with countries like Nicaragua. And so, they're again, they're doubling down on, as a country, the things that the people are presumably voting for, and I know that these things are always secondhand and at arm's length and people don't really necessarily understand the ramifications of their votes and their decisions, but the things that the polity are pushing uh, the, the political engine to promote are the opposite of what we're hearing. So in the gringo's dilemma, we're hearing that the Costa Rican people as represented by a single person in this case, and it's certainly with many, many other voices, is that they don't like that expats are being welcomed into the country, you know, at the rate that they are, or whatever. He's not saying immigrants aren't welcome. He's not saying that at all. He's just saying that there's an awful lot of them and the things that they're doing aren't super great for Costa Rica. Great, that's a good sentiment. Let's, let's make sure we, we hold on to that. But we don't know that he represents the public in general, but we do know that his voice goes against what the government is portraying as the desire of the people. And so we have to, to some degree, give Costa Rica credit that their government is probably trying to do the right thing and trying to represent the will of the people. And if so, this guy is in the minority, not in the majority. So that may be the case. Now, does being a bad gringo, as they talked about in the video, mean that you're gonna do damage to the environment? Of course it is. Don't be a bad gringo, don't be a bad expat. If you're gonna to move to a country, going there and being uh, in an enclave or acting like you're still in North America and, and just avoiding everyone and not being a part of things and building giant houses that don't fit with the environment and wiping out jungle areas, all that stuff is terrible. Please avoid that as much as possible, right? You wanna go and be, if you're gonna to move to a country, go and move to that country. Right? If you're going to build in an environment, build something that's sensible. This goes for anywhere. It doesn't matter if you're leaving the U.S. or staying in the state where you were born. Right? Be good about just your interaction with the world is pretty much what it comes down to. So that's pretty basic. Like, yeah, it kind of goes without saying. If you go and do damage anywhere, you'll probably do damage. Right? So uh, in, in the case of Costa Rica, yeah, uh, I think a lot of us perceive Costa Rica as oversold. A lot of us see it as just too many gringos there. I don't want to live in Costa Rica for those reasons. It's a beautiful country. It's wonderful people. It's got great stuff going on. San Jose is a great city. It's in a good part of the world. It's got an airport with lots of great connections. There's all kinds of reasons that Costa Rica would be absolutely fine for me. But of course, that over tourism has made the culture not what I'm looking for. It's made the cost of living not what I'm looking for. It's made crime rates not what I'm looking for. But 
it hasn't made any of those things so significant that it still isn't outdrawing every other country in the, re in the region to additional expats. So they keep, they being Costa Rica, keep making more and more money as more tourists and more expats flood into the country and start generating more and more money for the economy. And so that result, that is the desire that they are still tuning their decisions to promote. But remember, at any moment, I'm not saying kick people out. I'm not saying take property away. Nothing of the sort. I'm saying all they have to do is make some visa changes and they can really quickly take the number of people that are coming into the country and cut 99% of them off. Oh, there's gonna be a $100 fee. I'm not willing to pay that. Oh, you're gonna make me get a vaccine. You're just gonna mention a vaccine and not even make me have to get it, just mention it. Huge swaths of your people will instantly freak out that you use the word and they won't even consider your country. People will make a huge campaign against your country if you so much as mention thinking about it. So that's all you have to do. You don't have to stop anybody. You don't have to actually do anything. You just suggest that maybe you'll think about something that triggers people and huge groups will stop coming to your country instantly. And that's a really powerful tool. As a country, Costa Rica can easily retune their decisions, their marketing, their rules, their costs, their limits on visas, any of those things, and change how many people are coming to the country and make it much more expatty, much less expatty. They can gain more money out of the ones, right? They can make it that they're making more profit. So the ones that they are getting are able to pay more into the system. And the more they pay into the system, the more they can offset their damage, right? It's kind of like a carbon tax. It's like an expat tax. Fantastic things. These are mechanisms that governments have at their disposal to fix these problems if they perceive them as problems. And that's, I think, the most important thing here is that clearly, based on their actions, Costa Rica as a government has not yet decided that the expat dilemma, the gringo dilemma, is actually a problem for them as a country. And remember, with rare exception, those gringos, those expats are not turning into voters. In some cases they may, but in general they are not. They are simply residents. And so when you're seeing this vote happen, this is Costa Ricans who have been there for some time are making these decisions, continue to make these decisions. Of course, if you're a person who is not participating in the tourist economy, you don't realize, and maybe there isn't, some tie between the increase in economic uh, activity and your personal benefits, and you see your cost of living going up, you're gonna perceive all the tourism as a negative. And some people just don't like having tourists around. Trust me, I get that for sure. I grew up in an area with zero tourists. So anywhere that has any tourists, I'm like, wow, what a weird thing. It's always gonna seem strange to me because I grew up in Western New York. People just don't visit there. I mean, yeah, Niagara Falls, but outside of that, nobody, nobody goes anywhere. And uh, uh, so you're, you're going to have this response from a certain number of people and absolutely all people, right? I'm sure there's an exception, but all people in Costa Rica wish that the expats would come in and spend just as much money, spend just as much time, but instead of separating themselves out, you know, build houses in, in Costa Rican communities, hang out in Costa Rican restaurants, mix and mingle with the Costa Rican population and just make themselves a part of the environment, uh, but still spend all that money so they get the economic advantages, but be as innocuous, be as transparent as possible. But there is a disadvantage to that as well. The more that North Americans come down, or Europeans, and integrate into Costa Rican society, there is a limit at which the Costa Rican culture will not be able to sustain the integration. This is something that people don't typically think about because it doesn't happen that often. It's not that big of an issue under most circumstances. But if you have enough people come into Costa Rica and honestly try to integrate, Tons of Americans, tons of Canadians, they come down and they're like, we, we've listened to Scott, we listened to a Costa Rica story, we want to enter, we're not going to build a huge McMansion on a hill, we're not going to wipe out a jungle, we're not going to take away a monkey habitat, we're not going to enclave ourselves, we're not going to be separate, we're going to be Costa Rican, I'm down, we're learning Spanish. We are eating gallo pinto. We are taking public transportation. We are living away from the beach, not super far, but not on the beach. We're not going crazy, but we're going all in. We're hanging out at the local Costa Rican bar. We're doing this thing. That's fantastic. That's exactly what Costa Rica wants from any individual person. But if you do that on scale, you do enough of it, you will actually cause a skewing of what Costa Rican culture actually is. And you will actually, though, that sounds crazy, but Costa Rica is a very small country and the number of expats potentially going there is extremely high. And that kind of behavior can actually cause some damage that seems the opposite of what's going on. But when we're talking about the number of, for example, here in Nicaragua, we're a much bigger country with a tiny fraction of the expats. So 
every expat who's coming and being like, I'm going to integrate is a completely positive thing. They have no reasonable possibility of skewing the local culture or having any actual influence on it. Right? They may provide some outside insight, but they're not going to change anything. They're just, we're not even close. But in Costa Rica, they're actually close. Those things could happen. So those enclave behaviors, in some cases, actually can be beneficial, especially if you're talking about large groups of retirees or people who are older and not having kids, because if their kids are not going to become Costa Rican and they themselves could just shave themselves off instead of integrating, they may actually be doing Costa Rica a favor, or at least in many aspects, because they're not influencing local culture, they're not watering it down, they're simply holding themselves apart. Now, if you're coming down, you have kids, your kids are going to be born in Costa Rica, they're going to be Ticas, they're going to grow up Costa Rican, they're going to learn the accent, they're going to learn the, the food preferences, they're going to be, you know, completely Costa Rican, and in two or three generations, no one's going to remember that you had a gringo source, then Absolutely, that integration is a fantastic thing in every regard, or essentially every regard. Someone's going to have an example of something. But basically, it's really, really positive. You don't want to enclave off generation after generation where it's an increasing amount of enclave. But if you're coming down and you are not reproducing, then in reality, while for you, yeah, it's like this weird thing, that enclave may actually help protect Costa Rica a little bit. So a lot of these reactions that people have, I think, uh, maybe overreactions, that they're, they're worried about the way that these things are happening, but they're not looking at the big picture, and the people who are in power are not agreeing with them that these are actually problems. Now, maybe you think they're stupid, and maybe you're sure that it is a problem, but it's important to remember, it's not the expats that are making this decision. Yes, and any individual expat who moves down is deciding for themselves, no one's coercing them, no one's saying anything of the sort, but the decision to make it attractive, the decision to invite them down, is being made by Costa Rica at a governmental level, is being spread around the world. They are advertising, they're attempting to draw people in, they're making their visas draw people in, and all that makes it that that is what's actually driving this process, not the expats themselves. It is they discover Costa Rica, because Costa Rica makes themselves affordable, makes themselves accessible, makes themselves attractive to foreigners to come in. And when they do that, they then make it very attractive to purchase land, very attractive to get residency. And all that comes together to a process by which it is the government of Costa Rica, along with all the people running the tourist industry and all that stuff, who are actually driving this reaction, not the gringos. Now that's Costa Rica, let's talk about Nicaragua. Nicaragua, if you're not familiar, is the direct next door neighbor to Costa Rica. We're like their hat, a really big 10 gallon hat that's bigger than the person wearing it. So picture that. Anyway, so Nicaragua sits directly north of Costa Rica and we have a lot of things in common. We have the same volcanoes, we have the same jungle, we have a lot of the same water features. Nicaragua has a lot more lakes and things like that. We're actually a much larger country. Because they are so physically close and so geographically similar in so many ways, culture, food, weather, coastlines, location in the world, everything. There's a lot of comparisons always being drawn between Costa Rica and Nicaragua, and rightfully so. There's good reason to compare the two, but there's also good reasons to consider them very different. So let's start with a few really key differences that impact this particular discussion in important ways. One is that Nicaragua is physically much larger than Costa Rica, like a lot larger. Like the empty space of Nicaragua is so large that you could take all of Costa Rica and drop that into the empty space and it would disappear. That's how much bigger Nicaragua is even though they're directly next to each other. Also, Nicaragua, while it does have a larger population than Costa Rica, which is important from an absolute number of people in the Nicaraguan culture group, the amount that they have uh, of people per square mile is a tiny fraction of what Costa Rica has. So the amount of open space for development, both on total land and in how many people live per square mile, is far in the advantage of, of Nicaragua as far as being able to handle a lot of gringos. Then there's the obvious or semi-obvious fact that Costa Rica has long been a prime location, especially for gringos, to expat into, and Nicaragua has never really been a popular location for that. Some people remember that in 2016, 2017, there was a very tiny two to four year period 
in which a lot of people started finding Nicaragua on their radar. We thought it might be the hot new Costa Rica location. It had a sudden explosion in people trying to move here and pretty quickly that all fell apart and it turned out not to be on everyone's radar in the same way. There was some rampant uh, property speculation for a very short period of time that collapsed and now for quite a number of years we've been in a major uh, economic slump or at least a slump of the real estate market caused mostly by an increase that happened suddenly uh, about six, seven years ago. So with this, Nicaragua is fundamentally different. It doesn't have the, the land limitations that Costa Rica does. It does have some limitations, but it's nothing like Costa Rica. It doesn't have the tiny population that Costa Rica does, but it, it's only so much bigger, but it is millions of people bigger. And it doesn't have the high density of population like Costa Rica does. It's much less densely populated. So all those things come together to just physically give Nicaragua some major advantages. But then when you look at the geopolitical situation and the way that people have traditionally moved to Nicaragua, our starting point of the number of expats, let alone the number of gringos living in the country, is tiny, absolutely minuscule compared to Costa Rica. That's a starting point. But when we also look at the interest from abroad, Costa Rica gets nearly every country in the world pushing its citizens there for a lot of reasons. One is many of them are tight partners with Costa Rica, so they're in a position where they can't say negative things about it without it causing some international incidents. But also, Costa Rica is very expensive, and so when they push their citizens to it, they know that the number who will go there discover that it's a miracle location so much different than what they picture and so cheap and able to do things on a tiny budget, none of those things will happen. People will go, they'll say it's beautiful, some small number of people will potentially move there primarily as a secondary residence, not as a primary one, and they'll be able to keep their tax revenue in their main country. They take a little bit of risk with this, but it's very small, and they know that there's not going to be some big discovery. Yes, they may discover that Costa Rica is beautiful and all that, but they're not going to discover a place that defies the laws of politics in their home country. Nicaragua has a lot of reasons why big countries don't like sending people here. Of course, it's much safer than they like to let on. That sometimes causes problems because they depend on making the area seem more dangerous than it actually is. They want to make it that their partner countries look safe and that their non-partner countries look dangerous to make it look like the partnership, the tight integration, is somehow creating safety. But as we see throughout the region, the closer you are to the United States and Canada, the more dangerous you tend to be, the farther you are, the safer you tend to be. So Nicaragua has this incredible degree of safety uh, on a large scale that makes it not attractive for large countries to send their populace here to discover what it's really like. We also have a lot of advantages in healthcare and such at really low tax rates, which again defies the logic in many of the northern countries that say you can't afford to do these things even on really high tax basis. So when people see it done on a really low tax base, it causes a lot of questions, questions that people don't want to be asked. So there's a lot of reasons, including a lot of historical reasons, why the countries are not willing to make it look like Nicaragua is a good tourist destination. This isn't a video to talk about whether that's good or bad or whether they should do it or not do it or be angry about it or whatever. The point, and the point's not even to convince you to come to Nicaragua. The point is to say that Nicaragua, because of this, doesn't have the same concerns as Costa Rica. Costa Rica has to worry that massive numbers of gringos are going to show up every given day, and many of them are going to decide to stay. And some decide just to be tourists. And in this particular video that we're responding to, the person who wrote to the video host said, oh, tourists are fine. It's the expats that are the problem. But that's a very, you know, simple way of looking at it. In a lot of other places, people say the opposite. Well, the tourists are the problem because they clog the streets and they cause traffic problems and they make everything shift to Airbnbs and that kind of stuff. And the expats that actually live in a location don't cause those problems because they're not raising the prices. They're not doing weird things. They're shopping in the same places as the locals. Maybe shopping a little bit on the up end scale compared to the locals on average, but still places that the locals had without the gringos being there in the first place. So there's two ways of looking at this. In his particular view, it's the expats that are the problem, but in here in Nicaragua, you're much more likely to see the tourist as the problem if there's a problem at all. Now, there are some behavior differences. When you go to Costa Rica, the assumed behavior of most gringos is that they're going to be looking for enclave living. But when you come to Nicaragua, that still remains the minority. It's a large minority, the number looking to do that. The number who are researching Nicaragua probably leans in the majority to that, but the number who actually come leans the other way. In my opinion, I don't have hard numbers on that. But when you live out here in Leon, for example, we have no enclave living out in this zone whatsoever. All of the expats who are here 
are living like the locals, more or less. Of course, there's exceptions, but most of us are renting the same houses, not building specialty ones. We're in the same locations. We're living next door to Nicaraguans. We're eating at Nicaraguan restaurants, ordering from Nicaraguan takeout, shopping at the Nicaraguan markets. Nothing is custom for us. There is no isolated in any way. Of course, some of us go out and see other expats, like I was at dinner last night. There were other expats there, but not only expats, just there was some expats, some Nicaraguans mixed together, but there were more expats than there are in the natural population dispersion, right? Uh, so that stuff happens, but our degree of integration is relatively high. We're not having a huge impact on the uh, overall culture and environment different than any Nicaraguan would if we were just an extra Nicaraguan in the population. So that's a big cultural difference, that the, the way that Costa Rica is attracting people, the type of people that they're advertising to, the way that they're pushing their environment, and the way that so many companies have created enclave living in Costa Rica has made for this very separate us and them environment. But here in Nicaragua, we get a really high degree of integration, so it's much more of a you come and become part of Nicaragua. That being said, there's San Juan del Sur, there's Hacienda Iguana, there's Rancho Santana. There are places all over the coast that are all about separating yourself and not really being in Nicaragua, pretending you're in a Costa Rican enclave while having Nicaraguan jurisdiction. Yes, that does exist. Those places really are, except for San Juan del Sur, a very small minority. San Juan del Sur has a lot of the expats here, the largest single concentration of them but it still doesn't represent the most in the environment. It's just the most visible, partially because in so much of the country, the expats really do blend in to some degree. Obviously, we look different in most cases, but our ability to simply live in normal houses and, and go about normal business and not having to have a gated community with a special grocery store just for us, with special restaurants just for us, means that other than seeing us on the street, you really don't notice our presence in most cases. Now, I'm sure some Nicaraguans will jump on and be like, no, 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 we notice you, trust me. But for the, it's a completely different thing. It's a very different animal. Now, Nicaragua has the same decisions to make as Costa Rica, right? They can make all these decisions with visas and cost of living and, and uh, uh, cost of entry and all those things. Do they want to invite lots and lots of gringos and expats to come in and live in the country, whether as tourists or whether as long-term or semi-permanent residents? That's something that Nicaragua, like Costa Rica, is currently tuning towards. Yes, they don't have enough of them, according to whatever decision metric they're using, and they would like to invite more. So Nicaragua, like Costa Rica, is working very hard to open those, those gates as much as possible and be as welcoming as possible. And I just did a video called Does Nicaragua Want Me? that talks about some of those things. You can go watch that video and understand those factors, because I think that's pretty important to understand that Nicaragua is actually making a very strong statement. Yes, Please, if you're willing to come here, we would like you to come. Now in time, if lots and lots of expats end up coming to Nicaragua, Nicaragua has the option, the expected behavior of changing those decisions as they become prudent. Once there's land property, uh, <laughs> land property, property values have increased, once there's no additional empty houses sitting in inventory, then they're gonna to wanna to say, whoa, we've got plenty of expats. Let's start making it more difficult to get a residency visa. Let's not allow border runs in the way that we have. Let's uh, make a, a fee for coming in. Let's cap some things. Let's use quotas. Let's seriously close the border. That would be extreme. We don't expect that to ever happen, but those kinds of things are at their disposal. They can tune a little bit and you do see it happen. There was just this uh, issue with a vaccine. People respond in an unbelievable sense to it, right? You can see they made a tiny change, a tiny, tiny number of people are possibly affected, and the number of people who are like, I'm not gonna come to Nicaragua, I'm not even gonna talk to them, because they mentioned it. I don't understand what they meant, I don't know what they're talking about, but they mentioned it, I'm not coming. Well, that may, we, we all believe, everyone I've spoken to believes that Nicaragua wanted to tune who was coming, maybe not change the number of people, but they wanted to change who was coming. They wanted to see who was gonna have those reactions because they didn't actually affect anyone that we actually know, but they did cause a lot of people to have really serious negative reactions to something that was very confusing and people aren't bothering to look into to see if it's real or really what they think it is or so forth. So that's a great example of maybe that wasn't intentional, but it sure seems like it was. It seems to have had a really positive effect because regardless of what you're feeling on the topic of vaccines are the, rea the completely illogical, unresearched reaction to a rule that probably doesn't apply 
in a way that you just didn't care whether it applied to you or not. You didn't care what the rule actually was. It was that it was mentioned was enough to have this really strong reaction. And that's a great way for a country to be like, okay, no need to advertise to you. That was easy, right? Those kinds of things are very, very simple for a country to do. Now, Nicaragua doesn't go through the advertising levels that Costa Rica does. So Costa Rica is putting in some efforts that Nicaragua isn't. But Nicaragua makes some things easier for getting into the country. So they're doing some things that Costa Rica is not. Now, right now, Nicaragua still has a massive uh, uh, decline in property values. They have a lot of empty houses on the market. So it's for them, they're not looking at expats as being a problem that they need to start to curb, whereas Costa Rica has a lot of expats that are causing actual problems. Nicaragua has a current lack of expats and needs to get more in, in order to solve the real estate problem. We don't need expats building, we don't need expats doing anything new, just coming in and living in houses that are already here. Or, of course, buying some houses somewhere and getting locals to move to somewhere else. There's lots of ways to solve this problem, but they need more people because they have empty houses. Costa Rica doesn't have that problem. They need to build houses for all the expats going in, so they have a construction boom. Now, you can say putting construction workers to, to work is a great value on its own, and that makes a lot of sense, so Costa Rica is leaning that way. Nicaragua is not looking to do that at this time. They're really just looking at filling the houses that are there, keeping the real estate market going. So Nicaragua has a really strong drive to want to invite expats right now. But in the future, that is easily going to change. But Nicaragua is expected to make it less easy to come in. Right now, it's so ridiculously easy that it's surprising that the country is not completely packed with people. Because if really, it truly, if Americans and Canadians understood on large scale what it was like to come to Nicaragua, how easy it was, what actually was entailed, what the real rules are, which ones apply to them, how much it actually cost, how safe it actually is, what the weather's really like, which is quite warm, there would be more than Nicaragua could handle, literally in a day. But it depends on so few people finding out what it's really like that there's always a trickle of people who do find out or are willing to research. But if too many found out, it really would be more than they could handle really quickly. But channels like mine are not able to reach that number of people. We're not able to convince that number of people of those things. So yes, there's a fear that social media like mine and other channels and other outlets are going to get the word out and too many people are going to come to Nicaragua. But just because people find out about Nicaragua on its own does not mean it's a problem. It does mean that maybe some of you should light a fire and say, you know, I was thinking about moving in 10 years, maybe I should move in two. Get in and be a part of the environment before it becomes difficult to come in if that's really a fear that you have. And it's a real fear to have. That is an absolutely reasonable, logical fear that Nicaragua is super attractive and as people find out about it, because we live in a world where it's easier to find out that information now than ever before. Because that could happen, is probably going to happen. There will be an increased number of people coming to this beautiful country. And so because of that, there is cause for concern. But we do not have, at this time, the current problems that Costa Rica has. And we are not at a starting point where we're even in the wildest dreams of being where Costa Rica is from that perspective. It's also very important to note, Costa Rica has really gone all in on tourism, and kudos to them. They've done lots of great things with that. They are a world-class example of how good you can be at tourism as a country, with the exception that they need to clean up their bus stations. That really is a problem. Other than that, I've never seen anything quite as good. Like, it's just fantastic, everything they do as a country. Like, it's like a country like Disney World, right? But all ecological instead of, you know, fake. So that's just fantastic. Nicaragua goes to a very minor level trying to do tourism. They're not trying to push tourism in the same way. That is not their goal. They did try that in the past, and they got burned, and they decided that that was a fickle... Uh, it, tourism is a fickle mistress, right? You don't want to be dependent on tourism. You want to have tourism. Nicaragua loves that people come here as tourists. That is a great way to discover it and then decide to live here as an expat. In fact, the tourism business industry here is very much a funnel to create expats. Everything is tuned around that. The visas are tuned around that. But overall, Nicaragua's investment, their effort goes into infrastructure and business creation and industry. So they're trying to build sustainable industries that are responsible and do a good job and create jobs and, and fight unemployment, but do so without being dependent on tourism, which can so easily be influenced by outside forces, such as current weather phenomena or the availability of flights or global pandemics or the, the State Department statements of other countries. Uh, all those things can wreak havoc with a tourism industry if some other country decides to uh, mess with you. But if you have an industry that you control internally, you have a much more stable economy. So they're trying to make tourism be an ancillary uh, part of the economy rather than a core of it. Costa Rica is taking a very big gamble on that being their core, but it has worked really well except for the pandemic and they got crushed during the pandemic because of that. 
whereas Nicaragua, for example, did quite well. So there's some differences, some really, really significant differences. Even if Nicaragua was to go through booms like Costa Rica has, it would take a decade or two before Nicaragua had any chance of being anywhere close to where Costa Rica is today. And they have you know, 15 years of warning to retune their visas, to change their rules, to modify things enough to slow down that process. Plus we have more land, more people, fewer people per square mile. We have all these things. We could probably go 30 or 40 years of, with the same issues as Costa Rica and still be able to weather it better and, and be, still be able to make those decisions later on, whether those are things we actually want to continue having or if they're things we want to curtail. So it really, I know, and I really appreciate when people are thinking this way, because it's not just, you know, how can I be responsible? But how, am I, how am I a good person, a good expat moving into a new country? How can I be a good gringo? How can I be a good traveler? There's lots of ways you can be. And this video from a Costa Rica story is, is great in some ways, like go uh, have a smaller fo footprint, integrate more, don't come down trying to change things, don't try to bring, don't try to bring North American living down into Central America, all fantastic points. Also consider that Costa Rica is just overrun, but they still want more. And they still do have land. And this is just where the country is deciding to go. Nicaragua has so much open space, we don't notice the expats. And we're a long way from being at a point where we do notice the expats. When we get to that point, those things will be reevaluated. And you also can't just shut off the world. You can't just decide that there's not going to be a future growth. You know, uh, there's a couple factors there. One, if, if we were to shut everything off, if all of Central America was like, no more people. Well, now we're artificially forcing people into North America. Yes, they're artificially having to stay, but North America would have to absorb those people, and all those problems that are happening here would happen up there instead. So, and that's their problem. We can do that. It's our right to do that as sovereign countries, right? We can all do that. But it's still just creating that problem somewhere else. It's not solving it on a universal scale. And there is a natural amount of just people shift, and there is growth in economies and changes over time. And we can't expect these countries to live in a bubble, whereas expecting Europe or North America to continue to evolve. That's not how it works. All, everyone has to keep evolving. So Central America, like everywhere else in the world, is going to keep changing as well. And Central Americans, like North Americans, have to accept that to some degree. Yes, each country can make a choice how much they're going to try to cling to uh, some artificial aspect of history. And it may not even be real history. It may be something they make up because they just like it. Um, but that is an artificial creation. It's not their culture anymore once you start doing that. right? Your culture is what's organically created. And so... If, uh, if, if Costa Rica becomes an expat haven in that way and that's what they want to be, then that is part of who they are. And eventually that is their culture and that is a legitimate decision on the part of their, their country, right? And Nicaragua has to make those decisions too and just accepting that we are going, you know, the Nicaragua of 2050 is gonna be different than the Nicaragua of today. So is the Guatemala of 2050 and the Honduras and the Mexico and the United States. In time, places change. But when we're looking at other places, we have a tendency to see them differently. In the United States, if you looked at the 1940s and looked at today, you'd say, well, that was technological advancement, society moves forward, how could you compare those? Of course it's gonna be completely different. But when we look at Costa Rica over the 1940s to today, we're like, whoa, we changed their culture. Their well, yeah, we did, but so did they, and time and technology, and just, just things change over time, places have to adapt and evolve. No matter what is going on, no matter what their world context, they have to adapt and evolve. And so uh, I think in, in just many ways, we have to accept that we can't hold everyone in a bubble and isolate them from the world, from interactions with people, from their own decisions. Their own people have a right to move forward and be members of the world uh, economy and members of the world population. And uh, we have to accept that Nicaraguans and Costa Ricans do have a desire to be outward facing as well, right? They're not, they're not, the majority of their populations are not looking to be kept in glass bubbles as zoo exhibits for the rest of the world. And so that is just part of that, that if you have a great place, you do great things, people are going to flood in. How you control that through your legal processes, that determines primarily how that's going to work. And there's a lot of things that you can do that forces integration, forces non-integration, has higher costs for doing so, has limits on it. There's so many ways. So yes, I love and I want everyone to, just, whether you're moving somewhere or not, how can you be a great global citizen? Think about that. How can you positively impact the world all the time? Make that a part of your, your mental, that is today's mental challenge. Make every day, how can I be a great global citizen? 
But when it comes to, I don't want to move, I don't want to go participate in these places because I'm afraid, or I'm worried about getting the word out, I'm worried about people finding out and it ruining a place. I understand why there's that fear. Rick Steves exposed Hallstatt, Austria, and now it's overrun with tourists. But Austria could also have done things to limit those tourists, and instead they've used the opportunity to teach about their culture and to attract a lot more tourism, right? They have choices, they, they decide to go a certain way. Yes, Rick Steves caught them off guard. Suddenly they went from no tourists to tons, but that's not going to happen in Nicaragua. I'm not going to suddenly expose the country and have millions of people coming. Yes, I've helped increase uh, the expat rate. And honestly, if the government didn't want expats, right, they would reach out because they can and they have. And we would just have a conversation. Scott, we love what we're doing. This is fantastic. You make us look good. Could you make us look good in a way that doesn't make people want to move here? That would be fantastic. Right. Why am I telling people about this being a great place to live? Because it's good for the country, we think. Right? Obviously, you could be wrong. But it seems to be the right thing at this time. It seems to be the thing that's going to have the most positive impact that I can be involved in, right? <laughs> Miraculously inventing some new technology that makes everyone a billionaire and discovering oil under the mountains and then nuclear energy that's created automatically by volcanoes. Like all kinds of things could do better than I'm doing. But of my little piece of the universe, the one thing that I can do to make the most positive impact on the country that I love is to, right now, expose it for travel and tourism and expatriate. And that's the biggest positive impact I can have is by letting you guys know what it's actually like. But if that's not the positive impact that I can make, if I need to make a different positive impact, that is a conversation I'm open to having, right? And it's very simple for people to reach out and be like, look, we don't think this is the right thing anymore. Thanks for doing it, but let's, let's, you could make a better positive impact if you taught about our food or our weather or, or something and not about housing and not about how easy it is to get residency or that you don't even need residency and that it's easier than that and all these things, right? And I'm, yes, I'm still going to expose my everyday life and talk about how great it is being an expat here, but I would tell you, don't come. Come visit, but don't stay, right? We, we can't handle you if that's the way it was, but it's not, right? We can handle you. We can handle all of you. Every one of my, if every single one of my viewers with their entire families and all of their siblings and parents and, and grandchildren and all their families all came, okay, in one day, that it, uh, would actually be a problem. But if you all came over the course of a 12-month period, we would notice for sure but it would not be so many people as to cause a negative problem. It would be an amazing problem for Nicaragua to have to deal with yet that many people looking for apartments and, the, and housing all of a sudden, but it would be an extremely positive growth for the country. Now, at that point, maybe they would start being like, whoa, you yeah, know, let's, let's talk about this, slow this down. But we don't have that many, right? We just don't. I know it seems that way, but we do not. We don't have that much of an impact. So we really are in the spot where it's so good to be conscious of this and to be worrying about it because the fact that you're worrying about it basically guarantees you're not going to be the bad person, right? Yeah, you got to make mistakes. We all do. Uh, there's going to be something you don't know about, of course. But if everyone was having those worries, the world would be an amazing place. But you don't have to have those specific worries at this time about Nicaragua. That is absolutely not today. It is not next year. It is not next decade. That is not in the cards as a problem in the foreseeable future. Someday, absolutely, that would be cool to have that problem, but it is not now. So uh, just don't let that hold you back. If your concern is how do I do the best thing for Nicaragua, if you're worried about doing the best thing for Nicaragua, then the best thing you can do is get here, right? Like that's, it's gonna be that simple. If that's what your concern is, I'm not saying all people, if you are a person whose concern is how do I do the right thing, then, the right thing, the best thing you could do is be here, being that best version of yourself here. Let that sink in. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. As always, if you would like, subscribe, share on social media, tell some people about the show, cajole them, be like, look, you got to watch this show. He's long-winded. Give him some time. Yeah, he kind of grows on you in an odd sort of way, but he's got some interesting stuff, and you're not going to find this anywhere else. That would be fantastic. Go share this with more people, and I will see all of you tomorrow. And that one last thing that I always say, if you could click on these videos on the screen, that would be fantastic. That helps the show. And if you don't see one on the screen, find one. It doesn't even have to be one of mine. Every time you go from one of my videos to another video on YouTube, YouTube loves you.